Hey everyone, welcome to another AP Environmental Science lecture. We're going to look at in this um, lecture is how scientists use models to predict how things change in the future, and especially in regards to population ecologists, they use growth models to incorporate uh, density dependent and density independent factors. And what they try to do is they predict and they explain changes in population sizes. These models are very important tools for population ecologists. It could be protecting an endangered species, managing a commercially harvested fish species, or even controlling an insect pest. So in this module, we're going to look at several growth models and other tools for understanding changes in population size. So we will use mathematical equ equations, and this allows us, again, to see growth over time, population numbers, where they'll increase to, where there'll be die-offs, where there'll be decreases, and so on. And when we look at population growth rate, what we're looking is not only the number of offspring, but we're looking at, we're taking that number of offspring and we're subtracting the ones that die or the individuals that don't make it to uh, sexual maturity. And the first type of growth rate is intrinsic. And this is assuming there's these unlimited resources, conditions are perfect, there's no predators, there's unlimited food, space, water, and et cetera. And you'll notice the shape of the graph as we get going. A perfect example is domesticated hogs. Most domesticated hogs will have up to 10 piglets at a time. And again, assuming they're on a farm with enough space, food, water, and so on, these 10 hogs are then going to reproduce, and we're going to see this exponential growth take off. So our exponential growth model, we are taking a few things into account. The NT is the future size of the population with T being time, R being that intrinsic growth rate, remember conditions are perfect, and O is the number of reproducing individuals. In notice that reproducing is the most important, and then that E is the 2.72 natural log. And again, as I mentioned, it produces this J-shaped curve. So we see this all the time. It could be elephants, it could be plants, whatever it is. When there's not limited resources, we see this very rapid growth and this J-shaped curve form. Best way to think of it is as a savings account. You know, at first you put a little bit, of, you put $100 in your savings ac account that is increasing 7% every year. First 10 years, it's not doing much, but that, num that amount is accruing every year and increasing by 7%. And what we eventually see is a large spike in your money by years 30 and up should you not spend it. Same deal with populations that are growing exponentially. At first we have individuals, you know, here we don't have many elephants that are sexually mature and there's low populations, but eventually as population increases and sexually mature individuals are high in numbers, that um, population spikes as well. So moving on, we look at the logistic growth and now we're actually looking at we're incorporating these um, population limits, you know, lack of space, lack of food, increased competitors, things of that nature. And what we're adding here is this carrying capacity. And when we talk about carrying capacity, is what are these limits that are will not allow an, an individual population to increase growth? And here we can see like the exponential growth was J-shaped. In this case, when we include carrying capacity, our curve is S-shaped. So again, food becoming scarce, other than that, what we'll see is fluctuations. And the few things, what we first see when this happens is, first you'll see an overshoot. You'll see a large boom in the population, numbers will be high, but then they've surpassed that carrying capacity. Again, maybe there's not enough food in the, in this case, the sheep, there's not enough grass in the pasture to feed all the sheep. They've overshot that, they eat all their food, food populations go down, and we'll see this uh, large die-off. Perfect example here in looking at the moose population. This is an example of uh, 25 reindeer that were introduced to St. Paul Island in Alaska here in 1910. We have 25 reindeer. Population initially experienced a rapid growth, that blue line, and the approximated is that J-shaped curve, the orange line. In 1938, the population crashed, the, crashed because probably these animals exhausted their food supply. Another example can be a predator-prey relationship and how they control populations. 
and we'll get what's happening here. This was an example on uh, Isle Royal in Michigan where you had – you can see an increase in the amount of uh, wolves, but all of a sudden there was a virus that struck the, the wolf population. So populations plummeted and we see as a result moose populations increase. But again, going back to that die off in carrying capacity, the moose the same way the reindeer did on the island in Alaska probably overshot their food supply and as a result drastically dropped and here we can see the wolf population bounce back and they even each other out moving on we're going to look at reproductive strategies and population size most commonly increases through reproduction obviously so what population ecologists have identified a couple ranges in reproductive strategies in nature the first one is the case selected case selected these are going to be organisms with a long lifespan. It takes a long time for these animals to re re, um, reach reproductive maturity. The number of reproductive events are few. So in the case of, you know, elephants, for example, they don't become mature until they're 13 years old. They only breed once every two to four years and produce only about one calf at a time. So these case selected species are usually large mammals, as I said, most birds, and um, what we see is they cannot respond quickly to efforts that usually try to save them from extinction. On the flip side of that, we have our R-selected species. These have a high intrinsic growth rate, leads to population overshoots, large die-offs, and they produce large numbers of offspring. What happens here is those, as we said, they exhibit this rapid population growth, but those overshoots and die-offs create a graph where we saw earlier where they're going up and down, up and down. These are usually organisms that have produce many offspring. They reproduce relatively early in regards to reproductive maturity. They reproduce frequently. Things like your house mice um, that produce, they, they give reproductively mature around six weeks of age. They can reproduce every five weeks, produce up to a dozen offspring at a time. Many organisms that humans consider to be pests, such as cockroaches, dandelions, rats, these are our, our selected species. So here's a great example. Make sure you understand this table showing our case selected compared to our R selected. And again, with our, uh, this graph does a great example as well, showing that these R selected species, they'll overshoot, they'll die off, overshoot, die off, whereas a case selected species will usually hang around that carrying capacity line. Moving on, we look, we're going to look at some survivorship curves. So in addition to different reproductive strategies, species have distinct patterns of survival over the lifespan of individuals. And we can plot these in what we call a survivorship curve. And there are three types. Type 1, these have a high survival through most of their lifespan. But then at what we see is individuals will start to die off as they get to old age. Humans are a perfect example. Whales, elephants, again, usually case-selected species. Type 2 survivorship curve, what happens here, these have a relatively constant decline in survivorship. So most of the lifespan, what we see is there's this constant decline. As they get older, numbers will drop. And finally, our type 3, let me back up real quick. Type 2 examples are would be corals or squirrels. Finally, our type 3 survivorship, these have low survivorship early in life with very few individuals reaching adulthood. These would be these are selected. So again, dandelions, mosquitoes, things of that nature. We're going to close off with metapopulations. And what a metapopulation is, is these individuals, and we're going to use the example of the Florida panther, individuals that are either cut off by, you know, maybe a river or a mountain range and things of that nature. So it's important part of each population's overall persistence is to have this connectedness within populations. So small populations are more likely than large ones go extinct. But what, as we have seen, that large population or little genetic variation may not be able to help these organisms adapt. So what we see is this inbreeding. Um, but what with metapopulation, with we'll inbreeding in a second what we usually see is populations will find these corridors. So uh, example are these bighorn sheep. In the green is the bighorn sheep habitat. In California here, you got Barstow, Victorville, Vegas would be over here. But what they do is they find these corridors, maybe a little, you know, 
one gets lost and finds another population. This is a good thing because it increases genetic diversity. What we see though with metapopulations is a lot of inbreeding depression. And what's happening is this genotype kind of getting watered down. And the Florida panther example is a perfect example. We had a small 30 of them in Southern Florida, not much genetic variation. You'd see kink tails, they would have colics, but most importantly, they would they were developing developing abnormal sperm, which is resulting in the decline in the population because a lot, normally these offspring lose their inability to reproduce or survive. So with metapopulations, many species are a part of these, and it's important to identify and manage these metapopulations to protect biodiversity. So that wraps up our lecture. If you have any questions, you can always stop and see me.